Hello and welcome to another exciting Maya tutorial, this time in Maya 2019. It's been quite a while but boy has Maya changed. We've got now some fantastic integration with a new version of Arnold, Arnold 5. The UI in Maya is now more customizable than ever before and for animators like myself we can now actually cache our animations inside of the viewport which is absolutely great. It's been a long time since the last tutorial. Um, things have been busy, it's the best thing I can say. I started started a new job, I got married, moved to a new city, started a family. Things have been pretty hectic, but it's great to be back on YouTube one more time. Thanks very much for your patience and thanks for looking at all the material. There's uh, still comments and posts that come in and I am very sorry that I have not been able to get back to any of you guys, but I'm hoping to be able to catch up and basically start uh, being more active on the channel one more time. Um, we're going to start making here a new series about Maya 2019, but I really want to focus on characters and animation, which is something that's very near and dear to my heart, besides talking about all the usual tools and useful things. I'm going to be trying some new stuff out on the channel as well, so I'm going to be trying to edit these videos better. We've got a new sound setup as well, and I'm going to be trying to look at different ways of being able to present material, so I'm trying to cut some of the videos down, but or as always, feel free to leave comments to me below and you know let's chat about where the channel's going to and what you guys want to learn as well because I'm very interested in that. Another thing I'm going to be doing as well is that I'm going to be doing some classes on Skillshare which is another platform as well and if you like the material that you're seeing on this class on YouTube well I've got a more in-depth view of the class on Skillshare which I'm going to give you guys a custom link that should appear on screen and uh, you can sign up there for two months free of Skillshare for I think the first 500 people that sign up for it. So feel free to use it. And I also wanna say that I'm not stopping doing YouTube stuff to do Skillshare. At this point in time, I'm trying to do both to an extent. And other people have asked me of why don't I start a Patreon or a Coffee? And I will just say, I've just been busy. <laughs> That's the only real reason why. So my plans very much are on YouTube. I want to keep giving you guys great free material about Maya to learn the skills and aspects of the actual uh, software. And if you're really interested in animation and like an in-depth look at how to become an animator, well, come over to Skillshare and see some of the work that I'm doing there. And again, no strings attached whatsoever. Um, also, as per usual on YouTube, feel free to subscribe and use the bell as well. Uh, you guys know how YouTube works, but currently as I'm starting up again, I won't have a very regular um, uh, production schedule for a little while until I get things running again and I can start cranking the content out one more time. So enough about that. Today, I wanna start talking about creating animations and we're going to start off with some very basic stuff about understanding how to animate inside of Maya, how to use the graph editor, how to preview your animation and start developing an appreciation for timing, spacing and some of the very basic animation principles. So let's uh, uh, dive straight in. So we'll start off just by having a quick look at what an animation rig is like. You can see that we can have different types of characters, like the Kayla rig from Josh Schobel, and the uh, Spider-Man rig from Carl Figgins, and a very basic learning rig that I made myself. And you'll see that these rigs can be cartoony, slightly more realistic in proportions, or just kind of like very abstract. Instead of having something like a bouncing ball, we can have something like a bouncing capsule over here. If I bring up the NURBS curves, each one of these lines is a controller, which is something that I can use to manipulate the rig and pose the character. And you'll see that you have some very basic rigs, slightly more complex ones, which have things hidden away. And we also have things that are quite complex and allow you a large level of, of customization. But it's important that no matter which rig you're using, they all kind of work in the same way. I can select things and move them around to reposition the character. I can also rotate things around like that and depending on the design of the rig you can also move things around to add squash and stretch if the controls are designed like that as well. Now it's important that anytime I'm making a change to one of these rigs I'm going to be pressing S on my keyboard to set a key which will be shown as a red line down here 
and I'll also be working with auto key turned on. So it's really important that any time that you finish a pose, you select all of your relevant controllers and you press S on your keyboard to set a keyframe. Now, it's important that no rig is better than any other. It's important that they all work in very much the same type of way. They all can save poses and they all can create performances just by understanding the fundamentals of animation. So part of our work is going to be done in the viewport by setting down different poses. And another part of our work is going to be done in the graph editor. And we can get there by going into Windows, Animation Editor, Graph Editor. And inside the Graph Editor, I can select any one of these controllers because the keyframes are uh, saved on the actual controllers. So if I click off my screen, you see nothing. As soon as I select a controller, I actually have a keyframe set there. And what I can do is that I can come into the Graph Editor choose a key and I can manipulate things in the graph editor in the same way that I can manipulate things in the viewport in exactly the same way. So our main workflow is going to be always looking at things in the viewport and positioning them and then refining things inside of the graph editor. And we really want to start off with the absolute fundamentals with a very basic rig to start understanding some of the key animation principles like squash and stretch, like timing, like spacing, like easing in and easing out. And we're going to do that just by creating a very simple animation of this capsule bouncing across the screen and starting to think about what tools we need to use inside of Maya to be able to create animation. So animating in Maya works by placing a series of keyframes on the timeline. Most of the time we're recording differences in position, rotation, and custom attributes. Depending on how we space and time out those frames, our 3D characters will either move slowly if the spacing is closer together, faster if the spacing is wider, or in the case where the spacing is all on top of one another, it won't move at all. All of these objects have keyframes in and on the same frames, but they all move in different ways. This is due to the spacing. Now, if we look at them in the graph editor, however, and focus on the translate X curve, we will see that they all have different inclinations, where the important thing that I want you guys to remember is that if the line is horizontal, it means the object is still not moving. And the lines, depending on how steep they are, are faster or slower. So the steepest line here is the fastest moving object at the top. The graph editor is showing us timing on the bottom x-axis and spacing on the vertical y-axis. By showing every x, y, and z attribute as a line in a graph, Maya can show us different types of animation by selecting the appropriate channel. Now every time we select an object and look at it in the graph editor, Maya will frame the graph editor by focusing on it to show you as much of the curves as possible. So if we select either the top object or the middle object, their line initially will appear the same. However, if we zoom in, we can see the value of the first keyframe is around 24 centimeters while the top capsule has a value of almost 220 centimeters. So it's important to always remember that the graph editor will show you time on the bottom and spacing, or in this case distance, on the vertical axis. But remember that the vertical axis can also show you rotation, scale, or a custom attribute. Other things we want to understand about the graph editor is how to read the shape of the curves. We can look at the overall shape of different sections to think about what is happening with our motion. We have been looking at straight lines so far, and these straight lines are moving at a constant speed, or in animated terms, the spacing is even. However, changing the curve so that it starts from a horizontal and curves into the next frame is what we call an ease out. It is in a stationary motion, and then it starts to accelerate. The spacing of the curve is smaller at the beginning of the timeline, and it gets wider as we get to the end.
Now, the opposite of this is also true. If we start on a curve and the tangent comes into a horizontal like line, it is easing in or decelerating. As the spacing is larger at the start of the timeline, and as we get closer to the key, the spacing gets smaller. The next thing we should look out for in a graph editor is changes of direction. If the value of a curve goes up and down, we are seeing a change of direction. In this case, from right to left across the viewport. So the direction of an object will follow a change of value in the X, Y, or Z axis. And we should look at these as little peaks and troughs in the graph editor. Now I'm simplifying this animation so that it only has keys in the translate X value. But my adds a key on all properties when we're pressing S on our keyboard to save a key. We can remove these unnecessary channels by either selecting them in the graph editor and then selecting all of the keys and deleting them. You'll notice that the animation still stays the same as long as I save the translate X value. Or we can go into the channel box and select the relevant channels by holding shift and selecting them and then right clicking and choose delete selected. You can also add keys by selecting the single translate Y channel and right clicking and hold and choosing key selected. As you scrub down the timeline, you can add multiple keys by doing this method and it will only key one channel at a time. Selecting tangent types in the graph editor will change the curve's shape and that will affect the spacing. Now let's insert a new key in the graph editor by moving the play head and right clicking and choosing insert key. Automatic is a type of tangent that will, and we add it to our keyframes, will try to ease in and out of its neighboring frames in the smoothest way possible. If you move the value of your key up and down, the tangent will automatically rotate its handles to try and smooth in and out of the next frame. Spline, on the other hand, is an interpolation that tries to evenly smooth out the curve. And as we move the key up and down in this case, you'll see that it keeps its initial direction in the graph editor. This will create small overshoots, which sometimes are what we're looking for and other times are not. Now we've already had a look at linear and we know that it creates a straight line which means that everything is moving at a constant speed in our animation. Flat tangents will always place the tangent handles horizontally forcing the animation to always ease in and out of this particular frame. And the last mode that I want to talk about is stepped. This will make the object jump between keyframes with no in-between animation. This is a good technique for animating camera cuts and animators use this initially to focus on creating good poses without having to worry about in-between animation. Now coming over to creating our bouncing capsule exercise, the first pass we do when animating is what we call blocking. In this case, we'll be creating all of the keyframes that are necessary to describe the capsule bouncing across the screen, but we'll focus initially just on the very simple ones that we can make. Just by moving the capsule and setting keys, we can quickly find out how many bounces we need to get across the screen. I tend to focus on the up and down position first, and then I'll go back and start adding more details in specific passes. After I have those initial keys, I'll continue blocking this out by adding the rotations of the capsule just to show the change of direction when the capsule's hitting the floor and how it's bouncing off. I'll add an in-between using a custom script and copy the frame from frame 2 onto a new space on frame 3. Then I'll have one rotation going in and another rotation going out. Uh, you can shift select the keys and drag them manually along the timeline just to re-time your piece together so you can grab a bunch of keys and just move them along. We will also add a new in-between after frame 5 and also copy the previous key. While rotating, we're always going in the same direction, increasing the blue circle on the gizmo and going clockwise around the z-axis. 
Now we will delay frame 2 and 5 so that the spacing is larger, making the change in direction clearer and creating a sense of impact. Spacing works both in position and in the rotation values as well, so it's quite useful to have an object like a capsule where you can clearly see it turning. Just as we added detail around the impact, we'll add more frames on the top of each bounce. So let's add two more frames at frames uh, four and six, and then we'll add another two in-betweens at frames nine and 11. Let's position our keys by helping them describe an arc. So we're thinking about everything moving in a curve, and the spacing is gonna be closer to the top position of that arc, almost describing a parabolic curve. You can use the period and comma keys to jump between your keyframes on the timeline just to check the spacing as you go along. And you can now go back and refine the position of where the capsule is. It's important to remember that you don't have to get everything right the first time around when you're blocking. Blocking is meant to be loose and quick so that you can quickly make changes. Even I forgot to add an additional in-between at frame two when the capsule is actually coming down, so I can quickly add that. Now let's continue blocking out by extending our timeline to 27 frames. We'll shift and select our keys and we will drag on the leftmost triangle of the selection to scale our keys up to about frame 25. We'll then right click and hit snap. So this will put all of the keys on a whole frame. Maya can have keys with decimal points, which is really not what we want. Now let's create the spacing for every new in-between that we've just created using the translate and the rotate tool. Always focus on scrubbing between the previous and following keyframe to choose where you're going to position your new breakdown key. Here we're going to follow two simple rules. The first to create a clear arc as the capsule moves and the second to make the spacing at the top of the arc closer together so that the spacing will be closer together at the top of the arc and it will be further apart as it drops down or comes up. If we focus on the area where the capsule impacts and changes direction, just by choosing if the rotation favors the previous frame or the following frame of the impact, we can change how the animation feels. To me, it looks like if when the capsule is bouncing and we favor the previous frame, it is actually bouncing mechanically. And if I rotate it so that it favors the following frame, it almost feels to me like it character has control over its own movement. When we're going out of a bounce, the spacing gets smaller as we go up. We'll repeat the process for the next few bounces. Our process is to go in between the poses and move across the screen. We have to train our eye to see the motion as we go scrubbing through the timeline. And working between pose to pose, it's important to not place our breakdowns right in the middle of the two frames, but favor one or the other. Now that you've refined the changes of direction with the impact and the loss of momentum at the top of the arc, we can continue to go forward and polish those arcs up. To refine the arcs, we can go into the animation tool set and in the menu choose Visualize Editable Motion Trail and that will create a spline that will show the keys that we have created connected by a spline. Now we can visually edit our arcs into a smoother parabolic shape, but I always recommend never to do this right from the beginning. When you tend to visualize the arc, you tend to work slower because you're trying to make a smooth arc and this can very easily change when you're adding many keyframes. So keep working loose at the beginning. You can use the spline to orient the direction of your capsule to follow along to improve its rotations. 
Even while editing, I'll add new in-between frames, in this case on frame 10, and two more frames around frames 23 and 25. I'll adjust the spacing later in the graph editor, but sometimes I just need a few more keyframes to help describe the arc better. You can select the editable motion trail by clicking and dragging on the viewport and selecting the spline, and choose backspace to delete it. Now, after you've added enough keys and smoothed out the arcs, either play back or play blast your animation and have a look to see how it looks. After we've finished this very detailed blocking pass, I'd consider it's a good time to start polishing our animation and go into the graph editor. Now, we've added a lot of in-betweens here, but what we're going to do is retime our animation by selecting all the keys in the timeline and doubling the amount of time. And in this case, we're only going to let Maya in between one frame at a time. But I'm happy with the impact of the timing, so I'm going to take some in-betweens out there and just remove a few uh, keys with my custom scripts. We've made a lot of keys, but the channels that we're interested in specifically are the Translate X and the Translate Y, and also the Rotate Z. We can actually ignore the rest, so feel free to delete them if you want to, as we did earlier in the uh, video. I can use an editable motion trail to continue visualizing the spacing and use my graph editor to notice how the translate Y curve is actually the one that closely matches what we see in the viewport. Now this is not always the case, but the up and down motion of the translate Y key is normally the curve that we spend most time observing because again it looks very closely to what we see in the viewport. In the Translate X curve, I'm going to select and delete all of the keys that are in between the capsule bounces. So when the uh, capsule is in the air, I'm going to delete all of those keys and set the tangent type to linear so that it has a constant speed. This is going to allow me to edit the width of each bounce by selecting only the keys that I need and moving them up and down in the values of the graph editor. Notice how the shape of the motion trail becomes more parabolic with this change. You can also change the width of each bounce easily now. Make your view as wide as possible and review each one of these. You can also do a pass in smoothing out the rotations if you have any hitches and try adding some spline tangents here. So well done on completing the first tutorial in animation. Now, all of the stuff that we've been doing right now is just the fundamentals. We're talking about how to use the, uh, the graph editor, how to position things in the viewport, and how to start thinking about terms such as blocking. And it's really up to you guys now to practice and develop your eye for how to make things move across the screen. And we're gonna be doing more of that in the YouTube lessons to come as well. Now, if you are interested in learning more about specifically timing and spacing, well, you can head over to the Skillshare class that I mentioned at the beginning of the video. And I wanna always point out, this is just a deeper dive into very, very, very specific exercises that if you're interested in specifically becoming an animator, I think those uh, that class is gonna be very useful for you. However, if you just wanna know the ins and outs of Maya, then stick to the stuff that's going on on YouTube, okay? Also with the channel, the th main thing that I want to say is that everything at this stage is very experimental. I've been off YouTube for quite a while and I'm right now finding my feet. I've taken some of the comments that you guys have left me from pre uh, the previous uh, tutorials we've done and looked at the comments as well of what you guys wanted and I'm hoping to address a few of those things just one step at a time. Currently, I don't know when the next video will come out, but I hope it's soon. So subscribe, hit the bell button. As soon as those videos are ready, I will be posting them out to you guys and getting to them as soon as possible. And I hope to get back into that rhythm of being able to post a video a week. But right now with family, work and other commitments, it's a struggle. But I still want to keep making this great content for you guys. So if you guys have any comments or questions, again, 
just post them down in the comment section below. I'm going to be more active there as well, so it's going to be much more easier for me to answer questions inside of the comment section. And especially I want to keep teaching you guys how to learn, how to learn everything you want to do inside of Maya so that hopefully you can start creating your own material as well. So with that, I want you guys to keep learning and stay strong and I will catch you next time.